Hey everybody, Steve Brzezbrowski here. Welcome to episode six of Reach for the Firefighter Badge. This episode, we'll discuss what is required to become a firefighter. Now, in the first five episodes, we've talked about different topics related to becoming a firefighter. Um, episode one started with why do you want to become a firefighter? Episode two dealt with 10 must-do things to become a firefighter. Episode three dealt with four reasons not to become a firefighter. Episode four touched on what does a firefighter actually do? Episode five touched on, do you really know what you're getting into? And now I wanna segue into what is actually required to be a firefighter. So without further ado, here we go. As a reminder, my websites have a lot of free information on there. Code3firetrain.com is my uh, promotional preparation and officer development website. So lots of great leadership and uh, training, promotional preparation information on there, as well as my Website I run for Chabot College's fire technology program, um, ChabotFire.com. So both have free stuff links with lots of information on there to benefit anybody, whether you're a future firefighter or anyone all the way up to fire chief. So this webinar is that I'm fortunate to be doing. And again, I thank you in advance for the gift of your time for those that are watching these. Um, are based on two of the three books that I've published, um, Future Firefighters Preparation Guide, and then the second one, Reach for the Firefighter Badge, two separate but distinct complimentary books um, that have a lot of good information that can benefit anyone around the country, regardless of where you're from. So the question that's asked of me a lot is, what is required by most departments to be a firefighter? Well, obviously the badge doesn't drop out of the sky, so you've actually got to fill out an application. But the question a lot of people have is, well, how do I do that? Well, obviously in today's world with everything be being so much web-based, you know, thanks to the internet, you don't have to leave your house to apply for most departments, if not all departments. There may be a few departments that still require a candidate or an applicant to actually come down in person, but especially now with all the social distancing and pandemic issues we're dealing with, you're gonna probably see the internet be the way to go for many years to come, even to the point that some departments are gonna probably try to do as much as they can online so you don't have to go down there, which makes it easier for the candidate but it obviously can be very challenging because uh, for some people it's you know nice to be able to go there in person and actually talk to people in person. So what is required by most departments to be a firefighter? Well, if you look at a firefighter job application and if you have never seen a firefighter job application, they're pretty easy to find. Just go Google that stuff, GTS, Google that stuff or Google that shit, whatever works for you. Go to the internet, Go on social media and just type in firefighter employment or firefighter job um, or fire departments hiring firefighters or whatever terms related to that or that position that you aspire to. And when you start looking at pretty much any job application or notice, regardless of where it is around the country, you're going to find simply just a few things that most departments require. Most departments do not require a lot of qualifications for someone to just apply. Most departments typically have what's known as minimum requirements. For most departments, 18 years of age is the minimum age. Now, some departments may have 21 as the minimum age group, but most departments, 18 years old is it. Now, you may think, I'm not gonna get hired at 18 or 19. Or on the flip side, you may think, I'm not gonna get hired at the age of 35 or 45 or 55. Well. Just like most departments have a minimum age requirement, most departments don't have a maximum age requirement. Um, some departments back east sometimes still have maximum age requirements, which may be like 29 or 30 or even 35, but usually that's based on their pension systems for the retirement benefits. But those are probably the very small exception compared to the rule. Most departments, it's usually a minimum, say of 18, and then there's no maximum age requirement. And as long as you can do everything that's required of a firefighter, there is usually no age requirement. So there's, I think the benefit right there is most departments, I mean, we can't legally discriminate based on age as long as you can do the job. Now you, wonder, you may wonder why some departments back East still have maximum age requirements. That's discrimination. No, it's like I said, a lot of times it's based on the number of years um, that you have to put in to get your pension benefits or retirement benefits, which are the same thing, obviously. So don't, I'm not trying to teach you to be an attorney or have you turn into someone that's gonna sue everybody, but know what you're getting into. So 18 years old is usually the minimum. Most departments also usually say high school diploma or 
GED or equivalent, that's usually the bare minimum. You rarely find a department requiring any education that's beyond high school. Um, in all the years I've been in the fire service, 28 plus years, and obviously four and a half years of testing to become an entry-level firefighter, I've rarely seen any department require, require, I mean, meaning you have to have it as a minimum requirement, require college education. Sometimes some departments may say, hey, it's highly desirable to have maybe a two-year degree or maybe classes related to fire science, fire technology. But as for a requirement, most departments don't do that because again, the more requirements that you put on your um, positions, the less applicants you have. And most departments today don't want to have a small applicant pool. They'd like a large applicant pool to be able to pick and choose who they feel would be the best fit for their department. So 18, high school diploma, GED, usually a valid driver's license. Now you may say, what if I live in California, but I want to work in New York? Could it happen? Yeah, chances are the requirements the same. Now, if you live in California and want to move to New York for whatever reason, you may or may not be required to have a valid New York driver's license when you apply. Usually what they say is you have to have a valid driver's license from somewhere at time of application, but then they may say if they hire you at time of appointment, then you'd have to obviously have a driver's license of that state, um, which shouldn't be a big deal, I would assume, as long as you got one of them. So usually those are the three main requirements that most departments require, and that's to apply. And you may think, well, wait a second, I don't see any college on there like I touched on. I don't see maybe EMT or paramedic or maybe fire academy requirements. Some departments require those things, many do not. And you may think, well, I'm not gonna get hired if I just, I'm 18, fresh out of high school or I never even graduated high school, I got a GED, but I'm 18 years and one day old. I got no chance in hell. Hey, never say never. When you start learning more about the firefighter hiring process through the webinars that I've posted on uh, my YouTube page and obviously on my internet sites um, previously mentioned, most departments, your primary score or your list placement, meaning the score that you have on the inner, the score that you have in the process leads to your placement on the hiring list um, is usually because of the oral interview. In most departments, 100% of your final scoring is because of the oral interview. So if you're shy and you're nervous and you do not like talking in front of groups of people or even just in the static position like I'm doing right now in a webinar format, this may be a challenge for you because you got to you got to do well at the oral interview. And the nice part is about the oral interview, there's ways to get better. Obviously, you can take speech classes at college. You can do things to put yourself in front of others, even if it's just your group of friends, your family members, to try to practice things and prepare things. There's ways you can do things without actually going to school. But if you want something bad enough, you can go out and get it. Now, some departments also, besides having things as minimum requirements, may have desirable requirements as I touched on already. Now here's the thing, minimum means you gotta have it. If you don't have the minimum requirement, don't waste your time, don't waste their time. If it says desirable requirements, don't feel inadequate if you don't have those things. But on the flip side, if you have all the desirable or a lot of the desirable things they're looking for, don't pat yourself on the back and break your arm doing so thinking that, hey, I'm in like Flint because they have all these desirables and I hit all of them. Well, again, just because they're desirable doesn't mean that they have to hire you. Maybe someone with no desirable that just meets the minimums had a great oral interview and connected with the panel. And before we go any further, I know a lot of people say, well, that person did well in the oral interview because they can talk a lot or they can, you know, sell a lot of BS and, you know, to the oral board panel. Well, it's not always that way. you got to be able to communicate and the oral board is actually looking at a lot of things. They're looking, are you going to be a good fit for their department? Do you have a great personality? Do you have great character traits? Are you someone they'd like to work with? Someone that will serve the community? So while there are some that may be able to sell a bill of goods to the oral board, you still got to communicate. So some minimum requirements, as I touched on, some departments do require you to have your EMT, which is usually a semester, maybe two semesters, depending on the college. Um, there are some private companies that offer EMT programs. Obviously, private companies are a lot more college, excuse me, a lot more expensive than, say, a college where, like at Chabot College, where I teach part-time, 
to get through the EMT program, it's actually two semesters, which is basically about a year if you think about it. It takes two semesters, one semester for the EMT class, or well, then you have a prerequisite class, um, sort of the first responder class. EMT is 100 plus hours, whereas at Chabot, we require the half that time, about 50 hours of the prerequisite first responder class. Now, a lot of people don't want to do the prerequisites. They want to go straight for EMT. And I taught that program for seven years. And as much as I'd love to say there's a fast track, there is no fast track. So for everyone on that, well, I just, I don't want that first responder prerequisite. Let me just get right to EMT. There's a reason there are prerequisites for classes. They're set up to help you succeed. Now, not everyone needs the prerequisite, but most do. When I was teaching the EMT program, even with the prerequisite class, we still started, you know, so you had to have the prerequisite first, the first semester, the um, first responder class. Even with that, we still would start with 50, 60 students on day one of EMT and the last day of the semester, we graduate half. If we did not have their prerequisite class, we'd probably still start with 60 and graduate maybe five or 10. So there is a benefit for you to have prerequisites. Now, again, everyone learns differently and retains information differently, but don't get turned away or turn yourself away from going to a program because they have a prerequisite. It's actually there to help you out in the long run. Um, and that's why a lot of times people say, well, I can't wait a year. I got to get my EMT because a lot of departments require EMT. So you know what? I've, I found a private company, which they're out there. Um, with accredited programs and instead of two semesters I can get it done like in three and a half weeks it'll be Monday through Friday eight to five three and a half four weeks I'm done okay that's an option and they of course will charge you a lot of money because they're a private company and they usually won't require any prerequisite classes because again they just want to get your money and get you in there don't get me wrong they'll probably provide some decent instruction but Will that work for you? For a lot of people, it will work. I mean, for some people, they don't need the prerequisite and they can handle the full semester, I mean, excuse me, the full boom, 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 three and a half, four weeks in and out done. Some people can do that. Others need the full year. Like at the college, the EMT program is one day a week. And for most people, one eight hour day was enough because of the amount of information. But again, you know yourself better than anybody else. So find out what meets, what works for you. And you know what? More and more departments are probably requiring EMT. Besides the previously mentioned requirements of 18, high school diploma or GED, driver's license, most departments, if they're going to require anything, are typically going to require EMT, just because it's, there's a lot of people out there with EMT. Um, some departments may require paramedic. And to get it, if you haven't done your research on paramedic programs, EMT is usually the prerequisite for paramedics. So to go to paramedic school, you usually first have to be an EMT, meaning you've taken the class. That takes you anywhere from maybe a, a month if it's a private school or maybe up to a year if it's a college. And a lot of paramedic schools, if they're good, will require you to not just be an EMT, but also to have field experience working as an EMT, anywhere from six months to a year or more as an EMT on an ambulance or a fire engine running 911 calls. So in theory, even if you wanted to start paramedic school today and you had nothing, no EMT, it could take you a year and a half to two and a half years just to get into paramedic school, which will then be another year to year and a half because that's how long paramedic school typically is, whether you find it at a college or a private school. Very intensive because now you're talking a thousand plus hours. So paramedic, the benefit of being a paramedic is that more and more departments are requiring candidates to be paramedics. Um, my department recently had a hiring process and we're looking at hiring 10 people. Um, in a perfect world, we would have ha hired probably almost all of them to be paramedics if we could, but unfortunately we couldn't get that many because the numbers are just not out there of paramedics. So if you are a paramedic and you have that, you definitely increase your odds because there's less competition. It doesn't guarantee you a job. You still got to pass all the phases of the hiring process, but it definitely increases your chances because there's less competition. And, you know, a lot of departments are still looking for paramedics in today's fire service across the country. Um, some departments may require you to have CPR certification. Again, if you go through an EMT or paramedic program, that's usually part of it. Um, some departments may require you to have your Firefighter One Academy completed through a local community college. Like in California, there's about 45 or so colleges that offer um, Firefighter One Academies, and most of them also offer a college two-year degree. 
And a lot of those also offer an EMT program. So at least in California, there's a lot of colleges that you can get your two year degree in fire science and also get your EMT and also get maybe Firefighter One Academy. And then maybe some of those also have a paramedic program, bingo. But again, that's not for everybody and every state's slightly different. But again, most paramedic programs are probably gonna be found like EMT programs, either at community colleges or in private institutions. Do your homework, find out what works best for you. Um, Firefighter One Academy, there are some departments that require that as a minimum or a desirable requirement. Um, as I tell people, even if they don't require you to have a Firefighter One Academy, it's still a benefit because it's the same academy that you'll usually have when you get hired on the job. So want to increase your chances of not just necessarily getting hired, but you increase your chances of passing a fire department recruit academy because when a fire department hires you, they're going to put you through their own recruit academy most of the time. You want to increase your chances of passing because not everyone passes the department's recruit academy. Go to a college firefighter one academy, especially that has the same curriculum because now you'll have seen it twice. So it'll make it a lot easier. Um, not to say you have to have it to be successful, but it definitely, definitely doesn't hurt to have it. And I'd rather make you, I'd rather have you crash and burn in the college firefighter one academy and not necessarily crash and burn. I don't mean to sound mean, but also, you know, get your bruises and bumps there. You're going to make mistakes. We all do, but I'd rather make them at the college level versus the department level. Cause once the department, your dream department hires you, and you're struggling in the recruit academy, which many do, especially those that have never had an academy before at a college, there's no turning back. You may not get a second chance. You may get fired from the academy or the probationary period, which people do. Whereas at least if you've gone through the college, hey, go through a college firefighter one academy. If you fail out of it, you can come back usually next semester. If you fail out of that, come back the next semester, but at least you get a second or third chance there. You don't always get those in, at the fire department. As I mentioned, college education is usually not a minimum requirement. If nothing else, maybe it's a desirable requirement. Um, a number of years ago, I remember seeing the fire department in New York, one of the biggest fire departments in the nation, um, require actually require 15 college credits. Now, 15 college units is not a lot, but they required 15 college units. Like, wow, obviously it doesn't hurt their applicant pool because they get thousands of applicants every time the FDNY hosts a test. So. College education does not make you a better person. I mean, I'm fortunate to have a two-year degree, a four-year degree, and a master's degree. I would do them again. Um, they've opened up a lot of doors for me. Do they make me any better than anybody else? No, but here's the point. They taught me a lot of different skills that I might not have learned elsewhere. I mean, they, I mean, there's a lot of benefits. I'm not saying you can't be successful without college. Many people are successful without college, but at least show some commitment that you can finish what you started and you have the chance to learn some things as well. Some departments may require, but mostly make it a desirable requirement to have some volunteer experience, maybe in the fire world, in um, EMS world or background, or maybe just volunteer in general. So I touched on some volunteer experience in the previous webinars. It's great to have volunteer experience, whether it's fire background, EMS background, at your local church, at your local school, whoever, wherever, have some volunteer experience. Because again, here you are, you wanna be a firefighter, you wanna serve the community, you better put your money where your mouth is by having a resume and a background that shows that you can not just walk the walk, but you can talk the talk. So really, I encourage you to start taking a look at job announcements around the country. And again, easiest way is just to Google that stuff and figure out who's hiring firefighters. There's also, as I mentioned in previous webinars, there's testing notification services like firecareers.com it's not cheap. I think it's like 10, 12 bucks a month. I think it probably, so it probably averages about a hundred dollars a year, but the benefit of their website is nationwide testing opportunities updated on a regular time basis. Meaning if the city of Baltimore is testing for firefighter, firecareers.com has already done their research and they probably, they'll post that on their website as soon as they hear about it. They do the research. And again, there's other companies out there, do your homework, do your research, find out what works best for you. That's money well spent because they're giving you information to your email inbox or text message or however you sign up for notifications. They're gonna do a lot of the research for you. So, and the benefit about that also is, let's say you wanna work for a certain department or a certain area. Obviously you can go to their website and do some homework on their city human resources section of the website or the fire department portion of the website. But 
especially if you want to work in a certain regional area or maybe you want to move out of state, one of the benefits of a testing notification service is that you can start looking, seeing trends. Meaning, I'm in California, let's say I wanted to move to Florida. Well, if I look at all the jobs available in Florida right now and I see a lot of the departments, yeah, they want you to be 18, yeah, they want a high school diploma, yeah, they want a driver's license, but a lot of the Florida departments, let's say, require a paramedic and a firefighter one academy. And that may be common in certain regional areas where they require a certain qualification. Well, guess what? If that's where you want to move to or work at, and that's what you see the trend being, you better plan on that. Just like in the early 90s when I was testing for firefighter to begin with, I knew that I had to have my EMT and my Firefighter One Academy if I wanted to work in the San Francisco Bay Area and a lot of California as well too. Well, at that time in the early 90s, paramedic was starting to become big and I started to see more and more departments requiring paramedic just to apply. That was the writing on the wall that, you know what, I need to go to paramedic school. I can get hired probably as an EMT or with a Firefighter One Academy on my background, but I really need that paramedic to open up more doors and it did. And it wasn't cheap. At the time in the early 90s, I think paramedic school through a private college, excuse me, private institution was upwards of $10,000. And that's not to mention all the money I lost because I couldn't work full time. That was a paramedic program, just two days a week, but it required a lot of studying and I couldn't work full time. I had to pare down to a part time work schedule. So I lost money. I had to pay money, but that money was money well spent because it narrowed down my competition tremendously. Um, instead of thousands or hundreds, I was, I was competing with double digits of people. And it, obviously, it, it got me a job and it got me a great career with a great department. So, yeah, it was expensive at first. And I had to save money for it and move back home to go to paramedic school. But you know what? I made that money back up, you know, within a number of years working on the fire department. So, we'll talk more about the benefits going to become a paramedic as time goes by. But for right now, at least, I just want to close this with the only way to start knowing what departments requires requires to do your research. You can never be too prepared. So look for the trends and uh, get at it. So again, thank you very much for the gift of your time. Um, I, as I say this every time, I hope you're finding some values to the uh, webinars or vlogs or whatever you want to call these that I'm doing and posting on YouTube and posting on my websites. Um, obviously I have lots more planned and I'll continue posting them as time goes by. If you have any suggestions, maybe of current things you'd like me to discuss, feel free to, uh, you know, get in touch with me. Um, my contact information is here. Feel free to connect with me on social media. In closing, good luck. Keep fighting the good fight. There's a badge out there somewhere for you. The key is not giving up. It's not going to fall from the sky, but if you don't give up, your odds of success will continuously increase. All right, take care and be safe, everybody. We'll see you next time.